This is the Cyprus News Digest with Rosie Haralambus. Coming up on this week's programme, will the new European parliamentarians roll back on previous plans to restore nature in the European Union? The loss of pollinators, these are the things that are going to actually undermine farming, not not being able to use pesticides. We need to take a couple of steps back, look at the whole thing much more holistically, and I repeat, support the farming community to get off the chemicals treadmill and move to something more sustainable. And a women's coalition meets next week to see how it can push forward on efforts to solve the Cyprus problem. We feel that women should be at the forefront of attempts at peace building, building trust between the two communities and um, reconciliation and cooperation between the two communities. I think much of Cyprus was both shocked and saddened to learn of the recent very untimely death of journalist, keen ornithologist and director of BirdLife Cyprus, Martin Helikar. He was also a tireless environmental activist. Over the years, we've talked to him on many occasions on this programme about a range of environmental issues, not just birds, and we will miss his always concise and informative answers to questions on topics of interest. So I thought that this week we would listen again to a chat that I had with Martin last June about EU plans to restore nature, part of which was a reduction in the use of pesticides. At the time, farmers across the EU, including in Cyprus, took to the streets to demonstrate against the plans – And a year on, with a new European Parliament elected, we are waiting to see whether or not the new MEPs will scale back the plans to preserve and restore our environment. So what Martin had to say last year still holds good today. Yeah, so indeed pesticides are one of the big ecological ills especially, but not only in, in farmland uh, in farmland ecosystems. And they've been recently shown to be clearly linked to the catastrophic decline in populations of farmland birds, so wild birds that rely on farmland ecosystems uh, across Europe since 1980 has been a reduction of about 60%. So that, there's that whole ecosystem aspect to it of course, a very big impact on on wildlife, especially when pesticides are not used carefully, but but even when when they are, even when they're used in a a licensed way. And then there's this whole new chapter, which um, in our opinion as bird life is long overdue and and very welcome, which is the effort to bring nature back, to put it very broadly under the Green Deal, you know, the sort of strategic level a direction setting agreement among EU member states. And this has two related um, aspects, if you like. One is the uh, nature restoration regulation, and the other one is the uh, sustainable use of pesticides regulation, both of which are taking shape at a Brussels level right now. So they're, they're being discussed Um, Relevant proposals have been put forward by the European Commission and then these proposals, these draft regulations are being discussed in European Parliament and also in European Council. So by our MEPs, MEPs from other countries and by our ministers. And it it seems very touch and go as to whether these really very forward thinking pieces of legislation are going to get through that discussion 
process unscathed. Yeah, and it's not just our farmers that are protesting, is it? I mean, pesticides is one thing, yeah. and you mentioned the bird life threat, but also, of course, all the pollinators that have fallen foul to this. But if we look at places like Ireland, they're bothered about the restoration of the peat bogs, aren't they? I mean, there are a lot of areas across Europe where different groups are saying we shouldn't be doing this and yet to me it seems a no-brainer because you can't bring nature back very well once you've destroyed it, can you? No, and I mean, if we're going to tackle climate change then a clear part of the solution has to be restoring nature and bringing back the natural systems that do a wonderful job of absorbing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and, and locking it away in, in, in wood um, or in, in seagrass beds. You know, it, it's a definite part of the solution and it's a, it's a win-win. It also helps uh, create a much healthier environment all around and much stronger ecosystems. And we need our ecosystems to be strong if they're going to survive all the changes that are already happening because of climate change and that at the moment are only likely to get worse, because otherwise these systems won't be able to provide us with the basic, basic wherewithal we need uh, to live, whether that's you know a, a, a climate that's, that's livable in or clean air or, or the food that we eat. I mean, we rely on farmland ecosystems for food. So, yeah. Um, it does seem a no-brainer in general. Of course, with any big change, there are reactions. But the main reactions to the restoration drive and the let's reduce pesticides drive and the, and the two relevant regulations we've already mentioned have been from big farming. They've been from the big farming lobby. And in fact, there's a, there's a report that's come out earlier today um, about the, the amazing level of influence that uh, some of the big farming organizations have at an EU level and how they've been working, working hard behind the scenes to, to block reforms that encourage sustainable farming, to hold back legislation um, on pesticides and, uh, and restoration. This is, this is really counterproductive, backward stuff but it's it is basically those who to put it you know in a very raw form it is those who are making a real killing out of business as usual be that uh, environmental destruction over farming or use of pesticides too many pesticides not wanting things to change yeah factory farming which i thought was on a decline but it seems it's not and we're talking about pesticides but of course if we talk about the food we eat it's not just the pesticides that are sprayed onto let's say fruit and vegetables and things but it's also isn't it the amount of fertilizer that's going into the soil to increase yields and that has an impact too doesn't it it does, and it, and it has an impact on um, on the atmosphere. It has an impact on groundwater. It has an impact on on the soil, and it's it's a serious source of of atmospheric uh, greenhouse gases. So, so the whole chemical heavy approach to farming needs needs to change. Now, it I think it's important to stress at this point, uh, and thinking in particular of the the farmers tractors blocking our roads in Nicosia last week. That yes. Farmers must be effectively supported to make this transition. Um, already, uh, as, as, you, as you mentioned yourself, Rosie, already a lot of the worst chemicals have been withdrawn and are banned in the European Union. Uh, not all of them. There still isn't a blanket ban on, on glyphosate, even though we know it's carcinogenic and has some serious impacts on, on bees. For example, so that should have been banned a, a while ago. The evidence is there. That hasn't happened yet. But when, when the whole system is hooked on chemicals and pesticides, yes, that's a terrible thing. But at the same time, you cannot ask people to change that from one day to the next, can you? And farmers need to be supported and effectively supported, I repeat, to make that transition. There are alternatives that are following the path of integrated pest management where you use 
everything else that's at your disposal. You work with the ecosystem, but you're also allowed to use chemicals, the least drastic chemicals, but you're allowed to use chemicals if it comes to a point where you're going to lose your whole crop. So it's a it's sort of a halfway house, but it can be very effective if used effectively. So solutions do exist even without going to the to the, it's not extreme, but in terms of the chemical farming spectrum, it is extreme without going to the extreme of organic farming necessarily. There are halfway houses that can be very effective. The regulation isn't talking about a total ban. It's talking about reducing it by 50% by, by 2030. It's still a very ambitious target. But, you know, difficult times call for bold and ambitious moves. Otherwise, if we're not making a real difference to climate change could be argued we might as well not bother at all. There does seem to be a sort of knee-jerk reaction on the island when anything like this is proposed. And I'm wondering how far, for example, the environmental services here have been in trying to educate farmers about these alternative possibilities and solutions so that they realise it isn't the end of the world if they start doing something slowly, slowly now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. And, and, and as I as I just said, you know, we, we need to support farmers to make this change. If you've been farming in a particular way for decades, and that's the advice you've been getting from the agriculture department experts, then you can't suddenly be expected just to put aside all the pesticides and grow organically. No, you need financial support that. And more than that, you need input of expertise. You need guidance on how to do these things and farmers need to be supported and common agricultural policy subsidies money from that huge bank of taxpayers cash that goes to the cap should be used exactly for that to make a smooth transition to sustainable farming in in the long term there really isn't an option the big threats to farming our climate change and the collapse of farmland ecosystems, the loss of um, beneficial insects, the loss of the predator insects within the system that control the pest insects, the loss of pollinators. These are the things that are going to actually undermine farming, not, not being able to use pesticides. We need to take a couple of steps back, look at the whole thing much more holistically, and I repeat, support the farming community to get off the chemicals treadmill and move to something more sustainable. Are you aware whether or not the relevant departments here have made any efforts in this direction? I don't have a full picture on that, so I, I don't you know I don't want to be definite on that, but I know most of the advisors within departments are advisors who are based on um, the philosophy of chemical high inputs, high outputs farming, which makes sense only if you look at yields and only if you look in the in the very short term. It's not sustainable in the long term. But to really arrive at sustainable food production and sustainability in that whole sector, we also need, as a society, to change our, our eating habits because there is no way that this this one planet can produce enough dairy and meat to support our growing human population. We all need to, I'm not saying we all need to be vegans, but we all need to reduce our intake of dairy and meat and increase the vegetable component in our, in our diet if we're going to get to a point where we can, where this planet can sustain us. And that's another message that doesn't seem to be getting through. It's not touted very much. But let's finish, if we may, back on this whole idea of restoring nature back. Have we yeah. made any efforts here in Cyprus? Because, again, we seem to consistently hear about trees being cut down and so on and so forth. And there are vast areas that have been turned into solar parks, for example. I'm wondering whether you think yes. there's a new way of looking at this because you could have some solar parks, but you could have lots of nature around them or underneath them, couldn't you? Well, 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 well first of all, let's not... Yes, you, you could do that, absolutely. And, and there are ways of combining farming and photovoltaics. 
and there's been some tremendous work done in, not yet in Cyprus, but certainly that's something we can look at. I can certainly imagine areas producing both halloumi and energy in the sense that you can graze goats in and around photovoltaic panels. But, but let's not forget that, yes, we need photovoltaics, we need alternative energy, but we also need natural systems to absorb carbon dioxide. We need seagrass beds off our shores, we need wetlands, we need forests, and we need scrublands. So we need to be moving to give back as much space as we can to these systems so that they can do that very important job of starting to bring our climate back into balance. At the moment, we're still very much hell-bent on development in this country. Development, which is the big threat in terms of habitat loss. So we need to change that whole approach. The restoration regulation that is being uh, discussed at Brussels level has some very good targets for bringing back uh, 30% of areas the restoration by, by 2030. Wouldn't that be amazing? It has some great targets for built-up areas as well to increase tree cover by 10% by 2030. These may look like or sound like daunting figures at first sight. But if we put our minds to it as society, they're, they're actually very, very achievable and will bring fantastic benefits across the board. We just need to start looking at this in a far more proactive and far more daring way. And the situation is so urgent that, yeah, we do need regulation to come in and, if you like, force societies to make the change I think politicians in general have not caught up with public sentiment on this. I think most people are well aware of the need to bring back nature wherever we can, uh, well aware of the fact that our ecosystems are collapsing, and I think politicians are dragging their heels and they need to catch up with this. So it's great to see the European Commission tabling some really ambitious regulations on, I repeat, cutting pesticides on nature restoration. I just really hope that business as usual won't win the day, that these things will get through um, the, the democratic process at a Brussels level uh, and will get approved and will get approved without getting hollowed out. So they still have some ambitious targets. And then, and then let's get started on this path to bringing nature back. We really need to. Well, it would help, would it not, if we had what I would call true leadership among our politicians, our governments and so on, to come out and say, yes, we need to do this. I haven't heard very many voices doing that. Uh, no, no, I mean, I, I, I couldn't agree more, yeah. I mean, I think, I think at the end of the day, we all have our part to play here, and certainly NGOs like Bird Life Cyprus uh, definitely have a, have a part and a, a duty to play their part, but at the end of the day, history will judge those who actually had the power to make take decisions and, and make changes fast. And, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think our, our current uh, leaders will come out very well in, in history books to be, to be written down the line. Um, but let's hope that that can change and, and change fast. And, you know, we, we have to keep pushing for this because it's, it's for the common good and, it, and it's very necessary. And, and at the end of the day, a lot of this discussion is about how public funds are used. And they shouldn't be used to prop up unsustainable agriculture. They should, should be used to fund a transition to sustainable agriculture and to a sustainable way of, of using the land across the board. Martin, hopefully if any of our leaders are listening, they'll take some of this on board and wonder what they can do to ensure a better future for us all. Many thanks for joining me. Let's hope so. Many thanks, Rosie. Many thanks. The late and much lamented Martin Helikar, long-time environmental activist and former director of BirdLife Cyprus, talking to me last year about EU plans to restore nature. This is the Cyprus News Digest with Rosie Haralambis. 
The Cyprus Bicommunal Women Coalition will be meeting again on Monday at the Lidra Palace Hotel. To tell us what they'll be getting up to, it's welcome back to the programme to Katie Clearides. Katie, can you tell us a little bit more about this group and indeed how people who are interested can join you? We're a group of women who've been involved in politics and some of the members are still involved, actively involved in politics and who feel very strongly about the Cyprus solution. We want a bicommunal, bizonal federation with political equality as specified in the UN um, resolutions. And we want uh, the body of work which has been achieved up to now to be built upon and finalized. So our main aim is to unite women around the idea that a solution is desirable and still possible. The reason we came together actually is because we were inspired by the Northern Ireland Women's Coalition and that's why we are under the auspices of the Irish Embassy here in Cyprus. As you probably know, the Irish Women's Coalition was a group of women from the two communities in Northern Ireland that were in conflict and they came together and uh, started lobbying for the peace process and um, they were extremely successful in their context and they managed eventually to get a seat at the negotiating table. The structure of the negotiations was different from what has been uh, used in Cyprus up till now. But we were inspired by hearing about these efforts from some of the women who had been directly involved, whom the Irish Embassy had uh, kindly brought out to Cyprus and given us the opportunity to hear them. Yeah, I remember talking to them when they came over here. Very inspiring stories, not an easy thing to do. Do you think that the women here in Cyprus and the members of your coalition are aware that it isn't plain sailing? That's what I came out to me when I spoke to those Irish ladies, that actually the beginning of the peace process was the beginning of a very long road. Of course, we're aware of that, and we're aware that the situation in Northern Ireland was quite different to the situation, or in many ways different to the situation in Cyprus. Every every conflict has its own uh, peculiarities. And we're also aware of the fact that, you know, in Cyprus, what we're looking at seems to be a frozen conflict, which has been going on for 50 years. So it's difficult to get people enthused about the idea of a solution because most of them feel that there is no chance of that but this is our challenge we were also encouraged by the fact that the secretary general had sent out um, his special uh, representative and we were hoping that you know her report would indicate that there was some common ground but whether or not that is the case we we feel that women should be at the forefront of attempts at peace building, building trust between the two communities and um, reconciliation and cooperation between the two communities. And at the very least, um, I think that is an aim we can achieve. I'd also like to say that there have been many women's organizations. There's been an enormous contribution made by women's organizations through bicommunal and other initiatives, but their work is never fully recognized. They have never been given a full seat at the table uh, that they are entitled to. And we feel that if women can work together and unite around a common cause, which includes the things which are of concern to women in both communities, not just the politics, but when I say politics, I mean not just the Cyprus question, but there are other issues which are of concern to women in both communities and which are made worse by the, the, the non-solution. We believe that you know, we hope we can achieve something. Sorry to interrupt you, Katie. I think it's very clear to me that women have been completely sidelined for years when it comes to discussing our national question. And we may have governments that keep paying lip service to gender equality and gender this and blah, 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 but it is blah, blah, blah. They've never actually come forward and done anything about it, have they? Do you have any hope that the current administration might change that? 
our hopes are more based in the United Nations, which has actually said that they believe that the the peace process needs to be redesigned and to be more inclusive, to be more transparent, to be more um, gender inclusive and youth and age inclusive. It shouldn't just be men in grey suits uh, sitting around the negotiating table. But obviously, we have a, a long way to go. But we believe that if women could be inspired to press both for a solution and for inclusion, that uh, more could be achieved. Well, more must be achieved if we're going to ever solve this problem. Now, tell us a little bit then about how people listening to this who think they would like to be included in the discussion on Monday can join in. I saw something on Facebook and there was a link to register. So tell us more about how this is going to work, please. Exactly, because it's at the Lidra Palace, uh, we need to have registration. So we have um, published the event on, on our Facebook page and we've also distributed it as widely as we can um, through the social media to uh, people that we know and to women's organizations. But uh, it does require registration because it, it's a UN uh, zone and, and they check the names as people come in but there's no limit on the number of people who can attend you know we would like to have a big gathering we want to hear from lots of women's organizations and individual women what they feel we can do all together as a, a large um, collaborative effort to bring about change in cyprus it starts at five o'clock. Have you any idea from past meetings how long you think it'll go on for? Well, it would be a maximum of two hours, I think. Yeah, I mean, if there's demand for longer, then of course we could stay longer. That's not a problem. But I, I think two hours is a reasonable amount of time to ask people to, uh, to devote. All right. And are they going to listen to people actually speaking first and then there's a discussion? What actual form is it going to take? Well, we'll have a small introduction because not everybody was able to come to the first meeting we had, which was a couple of months ago. So we need to, you know, say a few words about ourselves for those who don't know exactly who we are. But our, our aim is to encourage people and we'll be asking the audience questions to encourage them to express their views and tell us what they think and how they think we could move forward together. I know it's a, it's a time when things don't look very positive, but at the same time, in our view, it's in the interest of all the parties, actually, to find a solution. And uh, we consider that as a group of bicommunal women, uh, using the positive language of unity beyond ethnicity, which we have managed to... Um, to be able to develop, we can contribute to building trust and encourage state stakeholders to see the benefits of a solution. But obviously, we want as many people on board as possible. And of course, it doesn't only have to be women. We want uh, men who are our allies to join us, those who men who feel strongly about that we need to get a solution soon and that we need uh, to get more women involved to have a more balanced uh, process. Uh, of course, men are welcome to come and we have invited some men who we feel would be favourable to such ideas. Okay, so that's the Cyprus Women by Communal Coalition and their meeting at the Lidra Palace Hotel in the buffer zone here in Nicosia on Monday the 1st of July at 5pm. It'll go on for probably a couple of hours. Look for them on Facebook. There's a link there to register. Or is there a phone number you can give out, Katie, in case anybody isn't on social media? I give my number. Uh, they can contact me and I can... Uh register for them. Uh, so it's uh, 9941-1949. We should also say that we're going to use um, all three languages, so people need, needn't be worried about um, the language issue. There will be somebody there to translate whenever it's needed.
So that's happening on Monday. Give Katie a call or indeed look for them on Facebook. And the very best of luck with that, Katie. Keep us informed how it goes. I presume this will be just a continuation of the meetings that started earlier in the year and hopefully will continue with some tangible results, we hope. Many thanks for joining me. Welcome. Thank you. Well, that about wraps up this edition of the Cyprus News Digest. Many thanks for your company. Hope you'll join me next week. Till we meet again, take care and God bless. Bye-bye now.